Welcome to the Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris, and I'm your podcast coordinator and host. Our show is about bringing together the advice of experts from all the way across the cleaning industry. And for season two in particular, we're going to delve into how to utilize important connections to both elevate your business and your career. If that's of interest to you, just keep listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris. I'm your podcast coordinator and host. Today, I have with me Ralph Peterson, and Ralph is going to come in to help us talk about our structure of our management teams and how we format our business for success. So I'm going to go ahead and let Ralph introduce himself, and we'll jump in from there. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I own a housekeeping management company, and actually, my forte is in teaching. So I teach a lot of housekeeping management principles and tools in healthcare. So my main industry is healthcare, nursing homes, long-term care, assisted living, hospitals, that kind of thing. All right. Well, thank you. Out of curiosity, how did you get into this type of business? Completely accident. Actually, my first, um, I grew I grew up wanting to be a housekeeper. No, I I actually got into housekeeping. I got my first housekeeping job when I was 16 and I got a job my friend got me a job working cleaning condominiums in a ski resort. And they would be rented out for a day or two or three for, for people coming up for skiing. And it was one of the greatest jobs I ever had. And, and it's so funny to think that it would be a, it doesn't sound like it'd be a good fit for a 16 year old man doing housekeeping, but a couple of things. One, I was the only guy that was very helpful. And <laughs> I know. And, uh, and not only that, but, um, but you, you, you get a lot of, of uh, people leave stuff behind. And so if at that time, when that, this was, you know, 25, 30 years ago at this point, but at the time, if they left something behind, you got to keep it, you know, you had to wait like 30 days, but I got like the best pair of sweatpants in the entire universe. And you know, you could, you, they would leave beer and, and vodka and, you know, unopened bags of potato chips and it was just like one of those fun and not only that but I was a pretty good worker who could work on my own and so I I quickly got asked if I wanted to be an inspector which is somebody who just goes behind other cleaners just to make sure that the condo is clean as you know the way it's supposed to be and that little bit of authority was enough for me to just absolutely love it you know and then that's really how it started I I could probably, I think, dive into that so much because I'm sure you have so many interesting stories. <laughs> of course. I'm very curious. What brand do you were these sweatpants that they were so nice? Like, what uh, do how need dare to you? Out? How dare you? They were Reebok, actually. They were blue. And they, were, <laughs> they were Reebok. Absolutely. Yeah. They were. This is this is now, you know, this is 1986, 1987. So a long time ago, a long time ago. Ooh, so they were 80 style condominiums to be specific. They're very. Of course, of course, <laughs> they were the cutting edge at the time. They were, you know what? It was, it was, it was nothing like I had ever seen before. I didn't even know housekeeping was a business. I, I would have never applied for the job had my friend not told me about it. And it was just one of those things where it was fun. It was easy. You know, housekeeping is easy. You know, that's the best part about housekeeping. It's not hard work, it's busy work. And so if you've got a good routine and you can stay busy, if you have somebody who can stay on task, it's really not that laborious of a, of a, of a job. It's just busy. It can be gross sometimes too, which is, of course, of course, part of the challenge. But yeah, we have somebody who comes over once a month because I live with um, my parents and our house is huge, it's ginormous. Um, and she's like, I love cleaning your house. Like she gets so excited. And I was like, but it's clean. But she, and, you know, kind of listening to you now, I, I'm starting to like picture why she might like it, especially because we are the people who tidy up to make her job easier before she comes. <laughs> My dad's like, the cleaner is coming tomorrow. You have to pick all your stuff up. And then I'm like, that's dumb. She's clamming to clean. And then I'm over there picking everything up and making my room look nice for her. So... Yeah, let me say on her behalf, we appreciate that because picking up is not exactly cleaning. And the more you pick up, the easier it is for us to clean. Mm -hmm. We always laugh though, because my dad would come come through the kitchen spraying things down. <laughs> well, now that's cleaning. <laughs> He's 
he's gotten better about it, but he would actually start cleaning before she came. And we would just sat there and watch him like, what are you doing? She's going to wonder what we brought her in for. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, we, we, never, we never wonder. And, and, you know, the other thing about the cleaning industry is it's the type of job that you can get instant satisfaction from. You immediately see it's clean. It was dirty. Now look at this room. Now, you know what I mean? You walk into a room and you're like, oh my gosh, where do I begin here? And you start in the back corner and you start working. You turn around, you're like, hey, you know, it's that instant. You get to see the impact you just made right then and there. And it's so great. It's That's really why great. I let my room get messy before I clean it. For so you. There's higher satisfaction. <laughs> That's uh, definitely why. <laughs> sure, sure. And not because I have too many pillows, but I just hate picking them up off the floor after I've thrown them off my bed. So nothing to do with that. No. Um, but no, that's, it's very interesting. So you've definitely seen like both sides of it. And that gives you that leg up in a position like this now where you're teaching people. And I work in healthcare. And so in healthcare, housekeeping is different in that it takes on a different focus. So there's two there's two focuses of housekeeping, really in any industry, whether it's home cleaning or office cleaning. And one is the straightening up. It's the presentation. It's the making sure things look good. And then the other part is the cleaning, the actual soap and disinfecting and you know, of, of bathrooms and counters and all that. And so in, in healthcare, it's even more of a divided line where you have to you start with a presentation, like let's just make sure the pillows are where they're supposed to be on the couches and the chairs are where they're supposed to be because for some reason they're always moved at night. And so when you come in in the morning, all the lobby chairs are somewhere else. So that's that straightening up. So it's all presentation, make sure it smells good. You know, so it always has to smell good. It's a weird thing, but housekeeping is the type of industry that everybody in the world knows whether or not you're doing a good job whether they've worked in the field or not, whether they're an expert or not, everybody thinks they are an expert. And of course they only use two things to tell if it's clean, their eyeballs and their noses. And so if it looks dirty, it is dirty. If it smells dirty, it is dirty. Even if it's not dirty, there are times when odors happen without it place being dirty, you can imagine. And there's also a time when you can have the cleanest building or cleanest home and pillows are on the floor for some reason and it, the whole house looks like a mess. <laughs> you couldn't find high dust anywhere, but because the pillows are on the floor, the whole house looks like a mess. That's the challenge. That's how my room is. If my pillow, well, and again, I have too many pillows on my bed, but I haven't found the will to part with them yet. So when they're not on my bed, my room, looks disorganized if they're on my bed my bed is made the room can have stuff scattered throughout it and it looks a lot cleaner it's a magic magic switch <laughs> it is it is the you just talked about the most important housekeeping focus and that's the floor floors are it doesn't matter if again if it's a home a hospital a nursing home a, a, go next time you go to a shopping center go to target or walmart just pay attention now how, how the floors look i guarantee their floors look amazing and there's only reason one reason why their floors look amazing because they know it's necessary they know how important it is people shop more people feel more comfortable in a store that's got bright lighting shiny floors is there dust? Yes. Is there spills? Yes. Or is there some disorganization? Yes. Do customers care if the floors, I mean, if, if the floors look good and it's nice and bright, do customers care? Nope. But if you make those floors dull, if you take out some of those lights, everybody notices the smallest thing out of place because they're just looking for more dirt. So floor care. Oh my gosh. It's the number one most floor care is more important than cleaning toilets. Mm -hmm. I believe it because I've been to, um, I have a dog, took her to the vet and the floor was sticky. And like, it might not have even been dirty, dirty, but it was sticky and it felt nasty just walking on it. Like you felt like you were walking on something dirty and disgusting. And um, it was back when I got my dog and I was still like younger. So my dad had come with me. He's like, we're not coming back here. <laughs> just because of the it. floor. And just because of the floor. Just because of the floor. That's such a great example. That is 1 million percent exactly. And you wouldn't believe how many people push back against that. People, especially in, in healthcare, they really think, they really, really think that, you know, I, 
there's a there's a big question about infection control not to get too far inside baseball but how does infection control spread there's the real way it spreads and then there's the thought way it spreads the real way it spreads is through hand to hand contact it's from people not washing their hands how is COVID spread? Because people are not wearing masks, right? Because they're breathing on each other. However, even though it's from hand washing and from breathing, I can't tell you how many people believe it actually is from surface to surface touching. As if, if my desk touched your desk, both desks would come down with the coronavirus. It's simply not the case. Nine out of 10 times, it's actually person to person contact and breathing. So you would say, if you have, you've only have one housekeeper show up and you can only do floor care, make the floors look good, or clean and disinfect, like clean a, a room, people would say cleaning the room is most important. And it isn't. Washing your hands is important. Let me do the floors. <laughs> but they clean the floors too. Your people are going to believe they did the rest because they'll see clean floors. A million percent. That's right. So if you don't have clean floors, everything, everything dirty looks even more dirty. Clean floors, everything <laughs> dirty looks less dirty. It's so true. It's, and I didn't even realize it until you said it, but that is. Floor care, the number one, most important in any, in the bank, at church, at schools, everywhere. Most important is floor care. I'm going to remember that as I start looking at houses here shortly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, all right. So you've got this experience, you really understand the industry inside and out and you've worked it. I'm very, one last question before we dive in, just because I'm curious, how did you go from cleaning condominiums at a ski resort to working in the healthcare side of the cleaning industry? I got recruited. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I, I, I took a job as a housekeeping manager with a company when I was so I stopped working in housekeeping when I was 18. I only worked in it for a couple of seasons prior to being 18. And then I worked in construction. And then I went to night school and I got an associate's degree. Then I got a bachelor's degree. Then I got another bachelor's degree. And then I eventually got my master's degree. But after I got my second, I earned my second bachelor's degree, I got a call from a recruiter who was recruiting for a management company that he said was growing by leaps and bounds. And I had just got out of the Marine Corps and they were looking for people who could lead teams and make decisions. And, and I mean, it was like a 45 minute conversation. And to be honest, I was in, I thought everything he said matched with what I wanted to do about leading teams and being in charge and developing people. Everything sounded great. And then right at the last minute, right before we're about to hang up and I'm, I'm, I'm literally accepting the job over the phone, sight unseen. He goes, by the way, this is in housekeeping, but that doesn't matter, does it? And for a split second, I just thought it's housekeeping. And I was like, it really doesn't matter. If housekeeping is this great, if there's that much opportunity in housekeeping, sign me up, I'm in. And I remember talking to my friends and saying, I just took this job at this housekeeping company and the looks, they're like, are you crazy? <laughs> You just graduated with your second bachelor's degree. You just got out of the Marine Corps and you're going to work in housekeeping. It's like, yeah, but I think that, uh, I think it's going to be really great. Nobody, everybody thought I lost my mind, everybody. And that was, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So, and I've been doing it ever since. And it was right. It was working in nursing homes and, and I still am. And I, once you start working in nursing homes, if you like it, cause it's not for everybody, <laughs> but I love it. I just, I love it. It's so it's challenging and it's fun and there's routines and you can develop relationships. And of course, I've met some of the most incredible people that we've served, you know, residents who have lived there and, and it's had a real big impact on me. So I really enjoy it. That it's the stigma that people have for the industry is really sad sometimes, especially like I'm coming from you know, I came out of college and um, I'd been working for this company for a year and they offered me a marketing position. They said, we want you to create a podcast. And they were like, well, no, two podcasts, one for um, our JM side of things. So with janitorial manager, we have integrated ourselves into the cleaning industry. Our team that works for that product really considers themselves part of the cleaning industry has fully jumped into it and committed. And what's cool is watching um, as new people come on, sales reps or customer service, and they start to learn the industry and get into it. And it's like, it is this whole world, but everything that you see in any other business, it all exists here. And 
it's like you said, it doesn't matter if you're doing those kind of coaching and those management type roles in, you know, like this big marketing agency or a cleaning industry. Like, actually, I probably would be in the cleaning industry because sometimes the marketing people get a little, um, what I want to say, like, there's, it's, a, it's got its own stigmas, you know, and it, they're dealing with social media. So I like that I can post on social media, media, but I don't have to like completely wrap myself around that world that my world is podcasting. It is the cleaning industry. And this is where I'm having the most fun out of two podcasts I'm running. This is the one that I can get into. And there's people like you out there that just have this plethora of wonderful knowledge and are so willing to share and help others come up and learn that stuff as well. So yeah, it's amazing. You're absolutely right. I, I understand, especially like you're thinking like um, the clickiness of mm -hmm. industries, right? And how it's so easy for people in my industry to get pushed on the outside. But I got to tell you, I meet some people in my industry in housekeeping and I'm just like, man, it is that everybody else has lost that they're underestimating that person because they are so amazing and smart. Mm -hmm. And if you think for a minute, you know, let me put a little number on it. Housekeeping is the eighth largest industry in the world. That's crazy. In the world. That is huge. Like people don't understand it's how big that is. Worldwide industry. <laughs> worldwide. Every building you see, every commercial building you see is being cleaned by a housekeeping company or a housekeeper somewhere. Most homes are being cleaned by independent housekeepers. Every school is being cleaned by independent housekeepers. Every hospital, every nursing home. It is. First sees all those. Like, yeah humongous and to think for one second that we are not smart and driven and educated you are you're 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 i mean it's a billion dollar industry it's crazy i think the, the most industry. brilliant people find the way here because honestly like just the people i've talked to through here so brilliant and taking advantage of such a great opportunity but it's not just that like they don't just like take in the opportunity they they kind of spread it like they really want to raise their business up and do great and then to go out there when they're actually out doing the job, they're still kind of on the fringes, you know? Um, it's been an interesting year for sure for like that visibility aspect, but no, I, this is a really cool industry. I'm excited to win COVID's up and I can start to push my way to in-person events and getting to see people in person. So yeah, absolutely. we're hosting in-person events now. We're, we're not even waiting anymore because we work in, because we work in long-term care. Here's the truth. We've been around the coronavirus, working with people who have the coronavirus since the coronavirus started in March of last year. And we know how to handle it. We know how to deal with it. We know how to manage it. We go to restaurants. We go out to eat. We're, we're going to the grocery store. To say that we can't have an in-person event, I mean, we're all done. Listen, I work in a nursing home with 500 other people. I can go to an event with 20, okay? I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to a grocery store with 200 people in it. I can go to an event with, with 20 people. Certainly, if I'm going to go to an in-person event, one for the cleaning industry is more likely where I'd like to be than for, you know, anyone else. You guys at least know what you need to do to keep clean and not spread a virus. A million percent, at the very least, it's a clean. <laughs> it's probably more clean because we everybody's got a product they're trying. Yeah. Everybody's demonstrating a product. That's funny. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. So what we did come together to talk about today, though, is with all of these cleaning businesses, and there's all kinds of various ones, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're cleaning commercial business buildings or you're in private homes or schools, there is the management aspect of how everything gets done. And one thing I've learned talking to so many different people is there is like no set way that cleaning businesses are structuring their actual businesses to grow and handle their workloads. And so I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on how you think we're doing overall with that and where you would like to see more businesses go to improve their management. Okay. Well, I, I have been, I've written a bunch of books on management. I would say that I'm as well read on the topic of management as most people in my position we, where I've read an awful lot of theory. I read a lot about aggression and how to read people and how to talk to people and how to hire people and how to get the most out of people, how to motivate people, how to engage people, how to communicate with people, all of this big uh, circular kind of bubble of this is how you manage. And I have found 
that none of it matters. It's completely irrelevant if you don't have a system that you're managing. And so I always, it's, you know, it's kind of like that chicken and the egg theory, like what came first, the chicken or the egg. A lot of times people talk about management development, about how to handle difficult people, how to have tough conversations, how to communicate and engage and all that without ever taking the time to first learn about what you're managing, which is a system. Normally it's a system, a process. And I think it's always backward. And I think that's what gets most people in trouble. You promote somebody to a leadership position. And the first question they have is, you know, I've never done this before. What should I do? And you say, you say, um, get everybody to work just like you do and you'll be fine. Well, that's not helpful at all. I mean, I just solved world hunger if that was the case. I don't do, just everybody eat the way I do. Okay. <laughs> Could you imagine if that process worked? And so the truth is we teach, we teach what we call a leadership system. And it's not, it's not anything complicated. It has three components. We break down the components, but it's super easy. Number one, make a decision. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to clean a living room. Great. I would ask a bunch of questions. How are you going to clean the living room? What are you going to use to clean the living room? How much time are you going to give to clean the living room? What time are you going to clean the living room? And of course, who is going to clean the living room? Who is going to check up on it? That kind of thing. The next step is communicate. Who are you communicating to? You're communicating to the person who's supposed to be cleaning the living room. What are you going to be asking them? You're going to be communicating. How are you going to communicate? You're going to communicate one-on-one -on -one, in person. Are you going to communicate through somebody else? Tell somebody to tell somebody else. Are you going to hold up flyers? Are you going to make phone calls? Are you going to send a text message? How are you going to communicate? And then the third thing is real simple. Follow up. Make sure it was done. That's and then once you follow up, you're going to find out one of three things. Either it's all good, everything got done you wanted it to get done. It's half good, meaning it's some of what you wanted to get done got done, or it's not good at all. Nothing got done. And then what are you going to do with, all, with any of those responses? You're going to go right back to the top of that leadership cycle. You're going to make a decision. If it's all good, your decision is move on to the next project. If it's half good, your decision is let's go finish the other half. If it's not good, your decision is let's rework the whole thing. But that leadership system, decide, communicate, and follow up. If you don't learn that first, if you don't start, and you can literally with that model, it's just three, a circle with three little points on it. I can insert anything on there. Go to the store. Decision is to go to the store. Okay, how are you going to get there, right? Communicate, follow up. Did you get what you're supposed to be getting? You know, build a bridge. All right. That's the decision. Let's break it down. How are we going to build the bridge? All right. Communicate to who we're going to build a bridge. Follow up. Is the bridge built? Here we go on across, right? So anything can be put in that. So that leadership says that's what's the most important. And I think what I find, that's the biggest thing lacking. People are managing without even taking and paying attention to the system that they're trying to manage. So they're not given enough thought to what they're managing to because they're all like, I know how to motivate staff. Your job's not to motivate staff. You know what a manager's job is? to make sure the job gets done. That's it. That's it. The, the manager doesn't have the responsibility to change the job. They don't have the responsibility to come up with the job. They don't have the responsibility to make decisions about the job. The manager's job is to, hey, I need this building clean. I need this home clean. I need this factory clean. This is how we're doing it. I need you to make sure it gets done. That's all a manager's job is. Manager's job is to manage the system, using people to manage the system. If you don't know what the system is, if you've never heard of a leadership system, then you're gonna have a real tough time managing. I feel like that's so true in the way that a lot of people just say, okay, we're gonna go out and clean now. Like they don't stop and think about it. And that communication, well, too, even if you can get to the decision, you make the decision, everybody's really good at, you know, deciding to do something or other. Communication is, a huge hole for most people in most places, whether it's home or professional. And then that follow up and follow through, like, you know, just where are you at? What's going on? What happened? It's, um, I took a really great change leadership type class back in college. And one of the big things was your measuring thing. Everybody forgets to measure and assess what they've done. And if you don't do that, then why do you even do it? Because you're not going to look at it. It's like, painting a picture and not looking at the final piece. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
you know? <laughs> so comparisons are important. Mm -hmm. I can come up with a lot of metaphors, very photographic yeah. person. <laughs> <in that. laughs> All right. When, okay, so say a company has been chugging along and they realize they're not growing or they're not able to handle the workload, whatever it is, they actually take a step back and they, they look at their process and they said, this is not working. How do they get to that point where now they're actually looking at that leadership model, they're looking at like that management model of decision communication and follow up. How does a company that's already got established processes learn to switch and adapt something like that, learn to actually operate more smoothly and do all the steps they should be doing? Well, I'll tell you the, the first thing that as far as finding out whether or not you're doing a good job or not, do you know the only people who can tell you whether or not you have a good management team? Do you know who it is? It's your, your customer. Team? No. Oh, okay. Only the customer. Your team is not a good indicator. <laughs> it's actually the worst indicator. Your team can be full of people who really like you. It would stick up for you and defend you from, you know, hell to high water. But your customer, hmm, the customer don't care one thing about you. You know what the customer cares about? Them. Yeah. They mm -hmm. care about themselves and their money and what their value they're getting for their product or service. And so in housekeeping, if you have a, if you have a home cleaning business and you find yourself losing business, you're able to get the business, but you're not able to keep the business. I'm telling you, it's because you don't have a good leadership system in place because it's all about leadership. You are not doing a good job with you really good at making the decision. We're going to clean that house for these people for $75 every two weeks. Great. Good decision. Communicating it to the person who you're at, who you hired to clean it, all the rules and regulations, what the expectations are, and then following up and then making that counter decision. That's the piece you're not doing. That's there's one of those pieces that are not being that not being met. And that's the reason why you're losing business. That's the reason why you're getting poor reviews. That's the reason perhaps why you're not getting any referrals. Referrals are a good indicator on whether or not you're doing a good job as well, because it takes a lot for somebody to refer somebody else. How many times do you refer somebody, right? I mean, you, do you go to Target and go, I love this Target. I'm going to tell everybody I know about this Target supermarket, supermarket, and they're going to come. Never, never, right? You, you hardly ever do it. But if somebody comes up and says, hey, you've come, been coming here, getting your hair cut here for a couple of weeks now. How do you like it? And you're like, no, it's really great. Would you tell your friends about it? You're like, all right, I will. But you don't feel comfortable doing it, not because you don't like the place, but because giving referrals is tough. So just imagine if somebody is giving you referrals, how much they like your service. And then imagine how many people are not giving you, giving you referrals, even if you ask how much they're not very impressed with your service. And not only that, but not to get too much into the psychology of people, but people are terrible about breaking up relationships. People are <laughs> in relationships for years that they have always wanted to be out of, but they, nobody wants to hurt somebody else's feelings. So instead they internalize it and they think that, well, because I said till death do us part, I'll just suffer. All right, well, good for you. You know, you're going to be the martyr of your own life. That doesn't make any sense, but that's what people do. And so that's how a lot of companies hold on to customers, even though the customer is not happy because the customer is a little bit, you know, doesn't like the idea of having that confrontation conversation about how bad of a job you're really doing. But really, your customer is the only one you can listen to. So that leadership system, I think, is the most important thing that you need to be following up on. And if you really want to grow, do a good job with what you're doing and ask for referrals. Say, hey, how, how can we get better? You know, and just start growing in your own neighborhoods or growing in your own facilities. Or, you know, of course, I'm a big fan of cold calling too. I know a lot of people are not a big fan of cold calling, but I'm a big fan of cold. I don't like doing it, not to be misunderstood, but I do know <laughs> it's effective. I do know it's effective. Oh my gosh. If I had to be in a role to cold call, I would probably lose my mind because if I have to call somebody I don't know and who doesn't know I'm calling, I get so much anxiety. I will sit around all day and be like staring at my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Introverted at heart. I if somebody puts on my calendar, oh, we're gonna talk at this time, I'm like, oh okay, I'm calling right on the time, right on the dot. I'm ready for it. Um if somebody else is like, oh call this person, I'm like, do they know I'm calling? No, but call them. I don't care I do that. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really challenging. I, I'll tell you that the the reason that I do it other than 
because I know it works. That's the reason I really do it. But what makes me comfortable in doing it is I know that I have a great service. I have a great product. And my product and my service helps a lot of people. And most of the time, I'm not calling, hey, buy from me. I'm calling, did you know that this product or this service exists? A lot of times they don't know. I mean, could you imagine if you have the greatest, you could have the greatest product that solves cancer? Nobody knows about it. And mm -hmm. you're too unwilling to tell them about it. Nobody's, you, you can't cure anybody, right? So being known is way better than being best. Being known is better than being best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and too, I was studying, um, I'll be studying like somewhere at a bar or wherever, you know, right now it's a little limited, but I'll be talking to somebody and they're talking about their business. They own a business and somebody is keeping track of all their stuff on pen and paper. And I look over at them and I'm like, oh, really? Is that what you're doing? Because I, I work in a software company and we use our own products every single day. And I'm like, I will never go back to pen and paper in my life. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, I'm about to enlighten your world over here. <laughs> I do like, I do like the, the tablet. I do like the tracking tools mm -hmm. that um, your company utilizes for, for tracking and maintaining schedules and inspections and reports and all that. I really do. I, at the same time, the learning curve is sometimes a it's challenge. Very daunting. Uh, yeah, because it, I'm, I do, a, I do, I do a lot with paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to use a highlighter and a crayon either. It doesn't matter to me, but it's because we are constantly having our challenge in housekeeping, not only in house, I'm sure it's a challenge and everything, but I only know housekeeping it's my field, but our challenge <laughs> is things change constantly. And unless I'm going to have every housekeeper have a tablet that gets a notification of every change, whether it's a schedule change for next week or something we're doing today or just a notification about something tomorrow, all I'm doing is taking away from their ability to keep working. I mean, I'm already combating their phone. Their phone mm -hmm. is already a, a taken up. They should, they should get paid based on their phone users. They'd be mad. <laughs> <right? They, laughs> oh man, it'd be, that'd be interesting. Yeah, so, so like social media influencers would be like the all powerful right now. <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are. They are. They yeah. are. As soon as they like hit like 20,000 followers, they just keep going. And you're just like, how? <laughs> and so I like, I do like it. I like the electronic versions for managers. It's just, we in long term care in nursing homes and hospitals, we have to post stuff. So you can't just come up with a change of a schedule. You have to post it. And so it's a, it's sometimes a challenge to create a schedule today, post it today, have a change tomorrow, reprint the eight schedules, go back out, replace them all. There's another change, go reprint. It's much easier to grab a piece of white out, a little white out stick, go to the schedule, make the change in pen, <laughs> white it out. Yeah, no, I get that. I am... Um... Like I still take all of my notes on pen and paper, even though we have like a million different note taking things. And I bet you couldn't read them because I still take notes like I did in middle school, which is that paper is for some reason rotating as I go. And I'm filling in spaces because I refuse to flip the page. Um, <laughs> I hate wasting. Um, so I, I get it, but it's always fun to like see where people are at and things like that. And I get the learning curve here too, because I joined I worked in a call center, but I, we had, um, Outlook has one drive. I had no idea what that was until I joined, but I had used it, used it before because we had a shared folder that we used at my last company. All applicants went in there and then you pulled them out and you dropped them into your own folder. Mm -hmm. And um, it was always fun when somebody forgot to take out the ones they called already and then you were calling them twice. But um I will never go back to that system because I can't tell you how many times you called somebody that was like already called. Um, you know, I had never done anything in software. I grew up at my great grandma and my grandma's house. I grew up on the same toys that my grandma grew up on. And yeah, it's my favorite planning experience to be at an estate sale and see a woman in her 60s or 70s. And we're talking about top playing with the same toys. Um, <laughs> but, you know, our computer game was like, the little Harry Potter thing. And I probably couldn't even tell you how to open it up. I would just go in and press the little arrows. And that was the most exciting thing in the world. And then 
came here and they're like, do you have experience with computers? And I was like, well, I, I've used Word <laughs> on Excel. I think I once typed in an equation for, for biology class. Um, but yeah, sure. Biggest learning curve ever. Um, so I get people's fear when it comes to it, especially when it comes to the timeliness, because like you said, that communication aspect is already hard enough without adding in an extra element mm -hmm. sometimes too. Mm -hmm. So kind of going into that though, that communication aspect, you know, the follow-up and the assessment it's forgotten, but it can actually be really simple and easy to do, you know, looking at the job, is it done? Looking at your customers, are they happy? But the communication part isn't always the easiest. So what are some things that you would tell to somebody, like some tips that you would drive home to make sure they actually nailed down that part of the job? I got to say one of the biggest learn lessons that I've learned over the years is to be transparent and open and forgiven with things not getting done exactly the way we asked them to get done because we ask our housekeeping staff to be open and honest with what they did and did not do. And sometimes what they did not do is more than you wanted them to not do. In other words, we gave you these 20 rooms or this area to clean fully, and we want you to be honest. Did you actually clean them all or did you miss three? Now imagine being the housekeeper and you're being asked if you clean them all or you miss three, you're going to say, no, I cleaned them all. Hoping. Why do people lie, by the way? The reason people lie is because they don't think you're going to check. It's the only <laughs> reason. If they know you're going to check, nobody lies. Nobody. Li you're going to stop lying in a heartbeat if you stop being lazy. That's the truth of management. So if you always checked, nobody would ever lie to you. Instead, they become super transparent. They would be like, I did actually, you know what? I didn't move the shoes. So I know there's dirt behind there, but I didn't move. You know I mean? Like they'll look at inside. They'll be like telling you exactly, they know exactly what they missed. If you're always checking on them. In, in long-term care, we give, we give a housekeeper say 25 rooms to clean. So it's easy. There's not a lot of work. It's busy work again. It's not hard work, it's busy work. But there's a lot of rooms you can't get to and, you know, because you're walking into a room and they can't, you know, they're getting care from a, from a nurse or a doctor or something. You can't go in the room. And you also can't remember. Like if you had to go past room four at nine o'clock this morning at 2.30 this afternoon, do you remember it was room four? Probably not. You're like, I don't know. It was on this unit. There was one room I didn't get to. So you don't remember. So we created a form asking our housekeepers to check off the rooms that they cleaned and not check off the ones that they didn't. And the biggest pushback I got from that is they felt they were going to get in trouble if they didn't check off every room. And so they would lie. They would check off every room. It's not helpful for them to lie <laughs> because what I'm trying to do is ensure that we get every room clean. If you didn't and you say you did, I can't ensure that, right? So that being that open communication, being that transparent and saying, listen, we want 100% of the rooms clean today, but if you only got to 80%, be honest with me. You're not going to get in trouble because I know how easy it is to get off of, off of your schedule. And it's not always their fault. Most of the time, it's not their fault. Housekeepers are good, hardworking people. They're not slackers and out to just get paid for doing nothing. I don't know any housekeepers that are like that. <laughs> a lot of people have that idea of it. It's not true. So, I say, if you didn't get five rooms done, tell me what five rooms you didn't get done. You know what I'm going to do as a manager? I'm going to say, hey, tomorrow morning, let's start with these five rooms so that I can ensure you. We didn't get to them yesterday, but we'll get to them today. Right? I can't do that if you're not honest with me. And so I have to, so learning how to have that kind of culture where I'm expecting them to be honest and they're expecting for me to be understanding. And I am. That's great. It's a hard thing to, to create because you have to get over their own ideas of what management Super anxiety. is. It's very, mm -hmm. it, and we have them sign it. You know, we have them sign the bottom that I certify that the rooms I said I cleaned, I cleaned. Also, by the way, I'm signing that the rooms I didn't say I didn't clean, I really didn't clean them. And I hope I'm not in trouble. Don't get me in trouble, you know, because they're essentially saying I didn't do some of the work I was supposed to do. 
Yeah, it'd be different if, you know, you give them 25 rooms and they clean 12 of them. That's but different. They take, they take the whole time, right? And yeah. that that would be a pain, painfully obvious. But if they miss a couple and, you know, it's like you said, especially in the type of environment you're in that happens, you know, you're not going to always be able to get in there. And it's like the cleaner who comes to our house, I, we make sure in our house that there's a couple people home that we kind of circle around and vacate the spaces that she typically does first and give her that. Um, and she's really good at communicating. She's got comfortable, like asking now, get out of the um, room. I'm trying to clean in here. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, are you down in there? I'm like, yep. All yours for now. And she loves it. Um, but when she first did it, you know, she might've just skipped those rooms and been afraid to ask. And it wouldn't have been her fault. It's just because she doesn't know where those boundaries are. And, you know, she's not going to come in and intrude, especially because like right now I'm home, not at the moment, but when I'm home, I'm working during the day. And like my Nana, she's on a walker. So, you know, nobody wants to make her move fast, except for probably me, because she's always sitting in the same chair. <laughs> and I like to, I like to give her a hard time because I've seen her get up in an Amish buggy that has a step this big. So um, I always give her a hard time. I'm like, I know you can do it. What are you doing? Uh, so, but we're people, we understand, right? And management's job is to, to remember that. You to remember that if you can understand for other people that you interact with, whether it's your family or it's other management members or it's your own boss, then you can understand for those people who are reporting to you that when they're honest and they tell you, I didn't get to this job, there's a reason for it. 99% of the time. Yeah, there is. And there's another reason for it as well. And, you know, I'm, if you'd look at the way we, just the way that I feel during the day, if you had me starting to clean at 7am, I'm raring to go. I probably do. I probably, I know I do. I know I do a better job at 7am than I do at 3pm. By 3pm, I'm beat. I'm tired. I'm sick of doing this. So I'm kind of calling it in. And so that's also, that's actually how we started making our shift, we started doing where we were always having the, the housekeeper start at room one and go to room 25. And then we were finding out that room 22, 23, 24, 25, they were not as clean as room one, two, three, four. Actually, room one, two, three, four were the cleanest rooms in the building. Why? Because they had the most energy. They always got to them. They never missed them. That's why. And so we said, okay, let's come up with this alternating schedule where one day you're starting your room one, and then the next day you're starting your room 25. Then the next day you're starting your room one, then, you know, because you're going backward. That way it's kind of even, right? Because my job as a manager is to make sure all the rooms get clean consistently. So I'm just mm -hmm. looking for that consistent piece. But <clears throat> because there are rooms in the middle that get missed because of showers and care being done, we, we can't do the one side, you know, start one day at one, the other day at 25. Instead, we go, all right, what rooms did we miss? Let's start there. So we missed 9, 11, 21, and 15. Fine. Those are the rooms we're going to start with first. <coughs> and we just, pardon me, and we just make sure that those rooms that we didn't get yesterday are done first today. And you just, again, we're just managing the job. I don't want 100, I don't want 80% of the job done, but I do know that 80% is pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Well, and if you know you're not gonna get perfect out of everyone every time. In fact, most nobody can give you perfect all the time. You know what? I'd like to challenge even the idea of perfection in housekeeping. It's not even what you should be going after. What you should be going after is clean or dirty, clean or dirty. I had years ago. Nursing homes like to do inspections of everything, and so we had a a, a housekeeping. I mean, an administrator of a nursing home give us the rating was a one to five so a one to five is everything is excellent and a one is this is the worst thing you've ever seen in your life and she gave us a three on most areas of the nursing home which is not good it's definitely a poor performance and i had no idea why so i went and i met with the administrator i said can we please walk the building and you can show me what it is you're after and she's like sure i'd love to so we set up a time we start walking and i say so this lobby this front lobby here what would you like different? You know, what, what she goes, no, this lobby is great. Great is not the word. It was immaculate. It looked amazing. The floors were shiny. There was no dust. It was, I mean, it would look amazing, very pretty. And I say, no, no, hold on. You gave us a three. She's like, yeah, there's no such thing as perfect. I go, no, no, no. The form says a five is clean. 
a one is not clean. You gave it a three, which means you expect us to do something else to this lobby. And she goes, you can't do anything more to this lobby. I'm saying, I think the same thing. So maybe this should be a five. She goes, nothing's ever a five. And so I, I even wrote a whole article about it. I said, is 80 the new 100 then? Is 80% now the new one? If you can never get a 100, then why even have 100? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're saying that the, the hallway looks gr great and it's an 80 or a three, then three is my goal. I mean... <laughs> The idea that, well, nothing's perfect. That is a, a that is the opposite way to look at housekeeping. Opposite mm. way. To say that nothing can ever be perfect. That is a ridiculous, not a ridiculous notion. It's a ridiculous standard to even have in housekeeping. We're talking about clean versus dirty. That's it. It's either clean or it's not clean. It takes me back to like high school and middle school when you'd have those teachers who were real pleased that their tests were so hard that nobody could get a hundred. And you're like, you're you just know, supposed to- it? ask if we know it or if we don't know it you're not supposed to trick us and like we had so many teachers that and even in college you get to those teachers they were so pleased to challenge you and trick you on a test i was like no i want to be challenged in the classroom on a test i want to tell you what i know i can't do that if you just threw me an obstacle course and not a test mm -hmm. and then like nobody gets a hundred <laughs> um and then you're like well, I knew this stuff. I just can't remember every single detail of this one thing that you really didn't even teach us. Mm -hmm. Or you worded this question in a way that nobody really quite knew what you were saying. Um, it was just, you know, it's so weird. Yeah, that it's whole so, gotcha mentality is really. Yeah. Yeah, and like I was, I have a friend who's a teacher now. She's a high school teacher. She teaches freshmen. Um, so she's battling the, you know, re remote work environment. In fact, there's kids that just, they're not going to get the stuff done at home. Um, and, you know, she's almost left with the responsibility of teaching them freshman chem and physics and how to have a good work ethic at home, which is I hard. just taught two uh, ninth grade classes this morning. Oh, so you're, you're familiar then. Yeah. yeah. So she just gave a couple tests this week uh yesterday and today actually i think and she told me that she had no student get 100 and, um she had one student that was two points shy it was a 25 point test so she curved it up she's not really had to curve before um she took questions off which she's had to do before and then when she was talking to me she admitted those ones she didn't feel, feel she clarified well enough um and she you know that's so rare i think on at least from somebody who's not teaching to hear after years of, like I said, especially in the sciences, she teaches science. I've had so many teachers that won't say, oh, I didn't teach that well enough. They'll tell, just say, you didn't learn it. You're supposed to know it like this. Um, and it was kind of cool to, yeah, she's, I, I'm super proud of her. She's a super cool, um, she'll be 25 this year and she's doing amazing in her second year of teaching. So yeah, good for her. Teaching during a pandemic too. <laughs> Yeah, no question. But yeah, it's the same thing though when you're managing a team though. It's the same thing when you're grading someone on how well of a job they did. Why can't you hit like a five out of five? Why does, you know, it's like you said, perfection isn't, it's, it's not a realistic expectation, but it's also usually not the point either. Mm -hmm. The point is, did you do the job? So. Yeah. <laughs> I know it drives me crazy. There's a new mantra. I don't think it's a new mantra, but a lot of places uh, I'm hearing a lot where if you're having trouble staffing, so you don't, you can't find anybody to, to work with you and companies say, well, that's, that's too bad. You know, we're not using that as an excuse. <laughs> Again, with the starving children, imagine saying, well, uh, why are you starving? And they're like, well, we don't have any food. We're not using that as an excuse. We're not accepting that. Uh, you, I mean, it sounds so stupid, but companies are saying it all the time. They're saying it all the time. Well, it's, you know, like I didn't have food growing up and um, it's kind of, it would just be funny if somebody walked up to me, why are you hungry today? Well, I don't have food. Why don't you have food? Go get food. I have no money. I'm a child. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it, it's the same thing. You wouldn't go up to somebody like, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't yeah. you clean this? I don't have a mop. Yeah, the mentality out there yeah. is sometimes lacking, but 
That's we'll business. That's housekeeping. <laughs> the the point is though, with like this industry, if you can't change the way your customers are going to act, you can't go up to her and be like, well, you're not allowed to give a three on a job that's actually done right. Like you, you know, you can try to rectify it. You can come to the conclusion that she's reading that scale completely different than you and her standards are some like mindset about those standards are completely different, but you found out that you're doing your job and you're doing it well and she appreciates it. Yeah, um, she's scoring it well, that's all. Yeah, so you can set the standards and you can set the expectations and you can communicate and make decisions and do all of that while in your business. And that's really the point of it is affect what you can and set yourself up for success. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is what's really great about being an entrepreneur like me is I get to choose my customers. And so <laughs> not everybody makes a good customer and, you know, not everybody makes a good client. And so that's, that's good. Mm-hmm. I'm happy that I'm in the position where I can choose my customers. Yeah. You'd be like, this relationship is not working out and you yeah. get to make that decision too. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I think this is a good place to start closing out. So I wanted to ask, did you have any more advice or anything that you would like to leave us with? The only thing that I would like to say is that there is a real, just to highlight that there is a real need for people who step up in the leadership roles. And leadership is one of those things where most people fail at. Seven out of 10 first time managers fail in the first 90 days. And they fail for all kinds of reasons. And most notably, they fail for inexperience. They just never have done it before. And the expectation on a manager, whether you're brand new or you've been doing it for 30 years, is not is the same. Everybody expects you to be really great, even when you've never done it before. So it's very easy to get overwhelmed. It's very easy to get, get uh, to do it wrong and to make big mistakes. But it is the greatest profession in the world. Managers all across the world are... The every time you hear of somebody impacting somebody else's life, it's always somebody in a position of leadership. It's always somebody who decided to take the time and to teach, instruct, to show, to care for, to commiserate, to listen to. And it, so there's no higher calling in my position, in my in my opinion. So if you want to be a manager, there's all kinds of people hiring managers. If you the position, the job you have right now is not looking for managers and they don't think you have what it takes, go get another job because there's positions out there for people. We don't have enough people who are willing to step into a leadership position. And so our biggest thing is we need more people to step up into a leadership position. And so please do, if you feel like it's something you want to do, you ever wanted to give it a try, do it. That's my little PSA. All right. Well, thank you, Ralph. I greatly appreciate that. And that's where I'm going to end this episode today. So I want to say thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. And I think this is a great episode, so I can't wait to share. Ah, Thank you so much. It was nice having you here. (laughs) Thank you. All right. And then thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to another episode of the Business of Cleaning. We will, of course, see you next week. But in the meantime, go ahead over and read the blog post if you haven't. Check out the transcript if you would like. And We'll see you next week. Thank you.